everyone, welcome. Um, thank you for choosing to attend uh, our tutorial amongst the many amazing ones selected at Fatstar this year. Uh, I'm Indira, this is Fabian, and we're from, uh, we from GASIS, the Leibniz Institute for Social Sciences. And uh, we hope for that for the course of the next one hour and a half, uh, we can perhaps, if not convince you, but give you a primer of uh, what computer scientists can learn from survey methodologists and vice versa. Uh, so with that, I uh, hand over the mic to Fabian to take you over the first part of our tutorial. Yeah. Hi, welcome. Happy that you choose to attend. Um, we are going to talk about the Total Survey Error Framework and the Error Framework for Digital Traces of Humans that we have developed. And what we are or where we come from is the first slide I'm going to present. So this is my uh, rendition of what computational social science is in between computer science, applied computer science that is basically dealing with empirical data um, or sometimes also synthetic data and uh, the um, social science field, which is comprised of many different disciplines. Um, but in the case of, of us, of GESIS, it's, it's, it's the, for especially sociology, uh, communication, communication science and political science, and the quantitative part of this. And we are from this department there that basically deals mostly with the, um, the bridge to, to all these digital, new digital traces and um, computer science. And one thing that GESIS has always excelled in over the last 30 years, that's what it's most been, most been uh, basically established for, is to help in, usually universities or individuals to um, conduct surveys, design surveys, conduct surveys, pretest surveys, put them into the field, collect the data, archive it, describe them, and then just redistribute them because it's a huge amount of work. Um, and it's the leading uh, institute in Germany for this and for all kinds of surve surveys in this social science domain and also in Europe, one of the biggest. Um, so there's a lot of expertise in our institute for that. And that's also our, that's our co-author uh, array. Um, and we have been um, communicating a lot with the rest of our institute for over the years and basically tried to bridge the methodology and vocabulary gap between um, when we deal with surveys and what surveys are good at and what, where they maybe fail or how we deal with that and how social um, and digital traces are what they are good at and where we fail with those and see how we can align these, these approaches to uh, research pipelines. Um, before I start, go back to the uh, one step up again. So uh, by, at GASIS we also provide survey guidelines as a service if you're ever interested in conducting a survey. That's one of the things that we do as an infrastructure service, also to non-German, so that's not a thing that is only there for Germans, uh, if you're ever interested. And also have now a large focus on actually um, linking survey research and digital traces, for example, with ex ante linking where we ask people for their social media or we do web tracking studies. So if you're ever interested in some of these things, there's free uh, consultation if you're ever interested. And the last thing maybe interested for some of you that there we have also currently uh, open position in CSS if anyone knows of someone who needs a, who looks for a PhD position, for example. Okay, with that, let's dive into the content. So what is this about? This is about all the data that, we are, that is basically thrown at us uh, in some sense um, in, with social media services, but everything basically that we do on the internet all the time, which we call digital traces here. Um, and that is all kinds of social media services, but also things like shopping or, um, watching a video on Netflix, but also things like a fitness tracker or renting an, uh, a bike or taking part in a loyalty program where you put your uh, card somewhere or your phone and you get scanned. All this leaves traces of your behavior and of your, sometimes of your attitudes or uh, characteristics of yourself. And the question is how we deal with this. So what we're going to do, do throughout this tutorial is we're going to introduce some notation and the difference between service and digital traces. We go over the total survey error framework as it is uh, has, it, has been developed uh, or evolved basically uh, in survey methodology over the years and then introduce our framework uh, that we think is very handy uh, and al somewhat aligned to the survey error framework and then another um, application use case study to bring the message home how it works and then a short discussion if you hopefully have time. So 
typical sources of social data, uh, social science research are surveys in terms of questionnaire surveys, not geological surveys, of course, or um, anything else, going from door to door, calling people, um, etc. In psychology, it's more experiments and in, in, uh, economy as well, uh, economy, so economic science. And very rarely is there observations, like I can actually see some traces on the ground or something like this that has been neglected to a larger part, also because it's hard to do uh, in, in reality. Um, and with the advent of internet and digital methods or digital uh, technology, we have online digital surveys, which are, uh, can be very different or just very similar. To and then just the, the form is different, like you could write to people and they fill out on the internet. Well, but basically it doesn't, didn't change that extremely much. And then we have also online experiments. But what really changed is that now we have all this observation going on, which was formerly not really prevalent. Many, there were sociologists and other social science researchers that did this, but it was not, just not easy to get at the stuff that you actually wanted to know about. So now we have all this stuff going, flying, flying around, and the question is, do we now get uh, at the stuff that we're interested in? And that's what we want to uh, focus on in the next, uh, uh, like, uh, now in the next slides. So uh, this covers basically how are these surveys and how the decades of how we dealt with surveys and how to get good signals from surveys, um, how is that aligned with how we get good signals from these new digital observation uh, helpers basically or devices. What we're going to use as the, the um, working definition here is from Howison, data document for digital traces of humans, data documenting the interior actions of users with digital devices or services. I already see that's super broad. So that's basically everything where you leave a trace about yourself when you do anything as a human, yeah? This is also diff different to Anya. It's, it's very similar to things like social data, which sometimes is used. Um, that is sometimes meant to only refer to social web services and sometimes not. Um, basically we use this, or the big data is much, much broader. That could be a weather sensor, for example. Um, or found data, which could also be anything that occurs, but not by a human, for example, in a car or also weather or something. Um, but that's the de working definition that we, uh, we take. And then a survey is a collection of information from a sample of individuals through their responses to questions. That's the one that we take here with what's not mentioned here, usually inference to a larger popula unseen population. That's usually part of this. So that's the, the two things we have. And then the main differences um, between these are that surveys are usually designed, in a, the setup is designed, and you get a specific stimulus where, in terms of the question and the items that you put into your questionnaire, and you, and you basically then get the response afterwards. While this is not a trace usually in, in traces, in digital traces, there's no stimulus that you get beforehand. Uh, you can actually decide what the stimulus is. Sometimes you're, there's a natural experiment and you're lucky, but usually you're not that lucky. People react to something that you don't even know about what it is. Um, it, people are usually self-selected in the system or platform that you take the traces from, um, where, whereas we usually uh, carefully think about how we actually uh, have a target population, how we sample probabilistically from, from, a, from a smaller, smaller population to, to infer to that pop target population with a survey. Um, but here you also have usually all the people in that system often, yeah? So that's a good thing. While the self-selection is not that good of a thing. Uh, the signals are very different. Here we have a reaction space that's really constrained. Uh, even if you have full text answers, they're usually constrained in the topic that people are answering to, but more often you have actually have boxes to tick, yeah? This is not the case in, in digital traces usually. They're super broad and heterogeneous and noisy, and you don't, you have to clean them. You don't even know what they mean, yeah? And so on, then you have basically there's the large volume, it's cheap to get because it basically already has occurred. Um, small scale and costly for surveys, usually again, uh, also super fine grained for digital traces and maybe two, three, four waves for a survey maximum, but usually they're one off, yeah? And the other thing is that often digital traces, especially from any kind of social uh, web platforms are, are relational, you, you actually do not have to query like who are your friends, you get that often or your contacts or your, who you have interacted with. Often in surveys, that's not the case. Okay. And what happens is we have this data in the middle that has, it has now it has its advantages and disadvantages. And we have over the years, computer science and social sciences approaching from both sides and being hot on these data and using it for different things. But the, the, the thing is also, um, so usually what social sciences do, at least in the, where we come from, from from this area of social science, empirical social sciences, often um, 
to a co as a complement to what you wanted to research, like a question you had before. Maybe you adapt your question to the social, to the, to the digital realm. That's a, that happens. But often it's a complement to survey data or a complement to your questions. For example, there's a lot of going on in terms of combining service and digital traces in, uh, to complement each other. I mentioned web tracking, for example, with, with uh, repeated waves. Um, in computer science, it's very mixed. So uh, in the beginning, I guess, when people started, they just use it as a different, a new, another form of data um, to test their methods, to predict something, for example, stock market from Twitter or something. But this has also changed, and people move more towards the social science question, at least in conferences like ICWSM, dub, 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 um, and many data science journals. But still, there are some differences sometimes. I mean, there are people on publications right in the middle between this now in computational social science. But yeah, so and that also brings with it that there are different um, vocabularies used. So for example, in computer science, you will often hear people talk about bias, 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 bias in different terms. And, nobody, and sometimes it's not really clear what the bias actually means. It could be many different things that are biased in, in the data that you're having or in the method that you're having. Um, or um, out of sample accuracy or um, prediction bias. This, uh, these are sometimes terms that are not even used in, in social sciences. And there's often a miscommunication even going on about what is talked about. Um, so one thing we want to do with this is also help to share, um, establish a common vocabulary uh, for communication, but also help to co or cross develop some measurement theories that we can talk about the same things when we actually uh, uh, talk about how we measure, measure a construct, for example. And also the knowledge transfer in how we approach this and how we address challenges and errors. And lastly, simply like stand some standards and documenting how your pipeline actually works and how you report your results. And like actually, should, should you talk about this and this and this thing as a limitation or is this not important and you should leave it out? So that's the idea of why we actually came up with this. So back to some basics. So what you do when you try to understand a social phenomenon, this is taken straight out of the survey methodology uh, book, is you have a construct and we are, just as a disclaimer, we are going with, the, with uh, Robert Groff's concept of an error framework. Um, there are also several frameworks for survey methodology out there. Um, we are going with this concept of organization, but I think this is pretty, uh, uh, pretty basic. So you have a construct you want to measure, and you have a target population that you want to measure that construct in. So that uh, could be as a point estimate or like a distribution in your target population, and that's what you want to do. And a construct can be all kinds of things. So very gross puts it very, very broadly as the information that are sought by the researcher. So your things that the thing that you want to measure or the things that you want to measure. Um, and I, this can be attitudes, behaviors, or char simple characteristics like weight, for example, or something really sec uh, complicated like sexism or the approval of a politician, for example. Yeah, where you actually really have to think about what that means to approve of someone or to be sexist. So you can go from a very very simple things to very complicated things. And these are the things you have to define very clearly. And then you go and say, okay, for whom do I actually want to measure this? And this is your usually a target population, called the target population, and the set of people to be studied, basically. And again, this can be easily defined by, for example, everyone that is enrolled as a preschool student, or everyone that has the Spanish passport, or more difficult, for example, all refugees in Barcelona, where you have to go and actually define what a refugee is. Yeah? Because that's not, that's not, there's not one standard definition of this. Maybe you can find one, but that's more difficult. And then this is often in service a national population or a broader offline population, but actually it can be any system po population in the sense that I can, I can use Twitter to actually um, infer offline to all Germans or to all Spanish people, but I can also infer to all people on Twitter. So, it's not because sometimes we make this distinction between it's a platform study or not. Um, you can do that, but in the end, it just really depends on how you define your target population. It doesn't have to be offline. Yeah? I can also infer from all Twitter, Twitter users to all social media users, if that makes any sense. So that would also be a target population. And that, the thing where you actually uh, go off, you infer off platform is often or sometimes called social sensing if you ever run over. Wow. Okay. <laughs> what happens when you put your laptop on top of another laptop? That was totally part of the tutorial. Yeah. <laughs> I think I will just repeat this now. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, it worked. 
Good. Everybody woke up again. Cool. OK, so that's where we are. So now we are going to introduce one other term that is not really broadly defined as such. We say everything that you actually collect in terms of responses, but also like every single like or tweet or text message is a signal. So that's what we, how we frame it to actually connect the two, two worlds together. So everything you get uh, as, as a response back to your survey or everything you get in, in social media you actually have is actually a, a signal that you get from something. Yeah? And that could be digital, any digital trace, basically, or any survey answer. It could also be sometimes that the reviewer, uh, that the interviewer notes something down about the person that, or the home that he's entering. That's also possible. And we define as entities like the representation of the target population in our, our records that we're having. So that's also a little bit different than the elements of the target population, because what you're actually having when you have social we have digital traces on social media platform, for example. Um, you not have always one-to-one -one matches, yeah? So that doesn't really make usually a huge uh, problem in, in, in surveys. You have a phone book and you call the people. Sometimes you actually reach households and then you have to decide who you're actually talking to, who you're actually measuring in your target population. But often, if you have, you, you can basically correct for that pretty easily. Um, you ask the person, who are you? How old are you? Da -da -da, and then you link to a male of that age group, et cetera, and then you're done. Where you cannot do that always super easily in social media. So these entities are mostly linked to the elements in the target population directly, but not always. He is a famous German politician, and his page is run, his Twitter is run by his team, but he has also a private account, so there you go. And then we're going to talk about bots and these kind of things later as well. So we frame this as entities on social media especially. Could also be like an IP address which is even harder to actually assign to a target element, to a pop target population element. Um, or for example, it could also be a bank account or a fitness tracker that can be shared by family members. Yeah? So these things complicate the, the inference a little bit. But that's uh, the other thing that we do. So entities produce signals. So I'm going to talk, walk you to the turtle survey area framework. Who of you knows this? No one. OK, good. Then I explain it in detail. So that is, uh, it has been around since the beginning of the 90s, basically, uh, to help uh, survey researchers to plan their, their, um, to plan their um, design cycle um, of their surveys and to do tra trade-offs between some errors that they can accept versus the cost, for example, and then afterwards to see what errors have been, ha have been occurring or possibly been occurring and to document them. Yeah? So, Servers are costly, so sometimes, for example, I do error here, but I accept it because I know that it happens. I can adjust for it, for example, and I just do it, still do it because I have limited reach, outreach. So let me walk you through this. Ah, by the way, yeah, exactly. So, uh, because to make this clear, so an error here in Grof's definition means a deviation from the true value. If I ask something, someone about something and they, they give me a wrong answer for whatever reason, that's an error. And if that happens systematically to one side, like, for example, Females always answering very differently than males. Then it, that's a bias. That's a bias. It's a systematic error. Yeah. Just because sometimes bias and gets thrown around very freely, and that could mean all kinds of things. Here it means something very specific. So there are two, basically two arms here. The front one is measurement, and the other is representation. So measurement already holds true for one single person. So when I measure something, my construct, like someone being approving of a certain politician, I have to go through this, and I can already make an error here for one single person that I look at. So it's basically the extent to which my instrumentation, usually my, 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 my questionnaire, actually measures my construct. Yeah? So you might have heard of construct validity, but it includes more. It includes, I will go through this uh, in a second. And it accurately describes basically the true, if I would be omniscient, then I would basically know this, and I, this is, basically looks at how, what is the distortion to the true inner representation of, for example, the opinion of the person, if that can be even uh, put into strict terms. And the other part is, now that I have this, done this with 100 people, how can I go to my target population of a million people, and what are the errors I'm doing there? Yeah? For the 100 people, of course, I can just do the mean or something, but then that's only for them. For them it's descriptive statistic, but my inference would be for the million or two million that I actually want to infer to. So the first part of this is I 
I actually design my, my instrument. My instrument is so I define my construct. I define what I mean by sexism. I define what I mean by, by approval. And then I put this into questions and items that people can answer. Um, and when I do an error there, for example, I ask for something like, um, have, you, have you recently got a job? Uh, got a, or have you recently got a new job? I have to define what new job means. Like, I have to define if that means new contract for my old job? Or have I changed uh, professions? Do I, what, what do you mean by that? So job is one thing, or for sex, it would be, do you think um, men are superior to women in X, for example? And then you have to be sure that you're actually measuring the thing that you want to measure with this, with this question. Yeah? Usually you do several questions, you pretest them, you, you think about, for example, discriminant, uh, discriminant validity, construct validity, where you think, Am I measuring actually the thing that I want to measure or something else instead or as well? And you basically go through these logical steps and then you put them into questions. And the problem that can occur is that you're not measuring correctly. So if you ask that question, you're actually measuring something else or you're measuring this plus something else, like some mixture of, of constructs. Then secondly, you go into the field, you choose a collection mode, like a calling people, and then you do the, they have the problem that on the telephone, for example, people would not be as um, for example, as honest as they would be in face-to-face -face contact. So you, you would ask them, how often do you eat chocolate? And they would basically lie because they think that that's unhealthy and they would lie. So there's social desirability in here. Um, that can happen. Then the next thing that can happen is pre-processing, where you, that pretty self-explanatory, I guess. Uh, you annotate free text answers. You throw out people that always click the first answer in your, in your online survey, for example, etc. You merge stuff by hand. You lose your paper sheet where you fill out the survey. That's all things that can happen. And then you arrive at the survey statistics, like the, the, what you think is the survey statistic. You have a Likert scale for uh, fitness, for example, or healthy lifestyle. You arrive at a Likert scale for that person. And you do this uh, again. So it's um, basically, and you, of course, you have to choose these kind of measurements so that they work up, uh, across people. But here, you already make an error if you do it for one person wrong. Now, and then you go to the right side and you say, now, OK. Now inference to unseen population. What do you do there? You say, I want all the people that live in Germany or in Spain, and then you choose a sampling frame. That means you choose a telephone register or a census, and you say, I'm going to call all of these people. The first error here is already that you do not really uh, have all people that live in Germany with a telephone book, because not everyone has a telephone. Uh, and with a census could be outdated, for example. But that's something you usually have to take and you have to accept, and you just have to work around it somehow. Um, so that's the first error you have. You probably do. Then comes sampling, and sampling comes afterwards. So sampling is now due to infeasibility. I cannot go around and ask everyone in that census list. I have to choose somehow to call people. And that is usually done by, for example, random sampling or stratified sampling, where I choose to call people so that they that they have the equal chance um, compared to the target population in the frame to actually be in the sample. That is very strict definition of sampling in, 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 this, in this sense. Yeah? So that's what's done just because it's needed to be done. Um, if, they, if a survey designer would, they would call everyone, but that's very costly. Um, then, of course, I have people that do not respond. They basically don't answer my survey. That's non-response error or an item response can also happen that they only uh, uh, basically reply to a quarter of your questions and then they uh, interrupt the, the telephone call. And la lastly, you try to adjust for all these errors you did in the beginning because you can hardly avoid all of them. So you adjust usually with reweighting, post stratification. You reweight by demographics, for example, or if you have political leaning, you can, can also adjust by that. In terms of your reweight, you weight up. The, for example, if you have an underrepresentation of young people, you weight them up so that their aggregate is better represented in the, in the survey statistic that you get out in the end. And of course, you can over-adjust here, or you can set the weights wrong, basically, so that, or you just underperform here and you do not adjust enough, or you adjust only for one group and not for the other. So that's basically the, the survey life, the, the survey life cycle from a qualitative perspective, the error framework by Groves. And what we, what we now did is we tried to stay as close to this as possible. But when we started, we were like, well, cool, let's just throw this at digital traces. That's probably going to work somehow. And yeah, well, it turns out, of course, it doesn't in that way. But we tried to keep it as close as possible to, to this. Um, so the question was, can we apply this? But I guess the first 
was why. Like, why would we try to, to throw a survey uh, uh, error framework on, on digital traces? So there are two reasons. One reason is to make it more accessible for survey researchers that know the other framework. Secondly, we think that there are certain proven features of this framework that are very useful, uh, especially that you do an action and then res something results in a pipeline and then basically you get pretty um, um, mutually exclusive errors that build on each other. So we tried, want to try to, to also emulate, emulate that. So that's a good feature of this, of this framework. Um, and basically, yeah, so make it more transparent for these survey researchers and because of these features and also the distinction between measurement and representation. And of course, there's all kinds of, of uh, uh, literature out there that already talks about this, all the challenges with digital traces. That's not in question. And we're not going to redefine, reinvent the wheel here. Uh, what we're doing, we're doing a new, a new frame, a new perspective on the whole thing from survey methodology perspective more to actually understand it and to like order the errors in your head. And when you're doing a service in a study, then you actually can order them according to that framework. Yeah? So the first, uh, the first uh, challenge here is, of course, that you do not have a construct and you design a questionnaire or you design the stimulus. So you get, you get what I already said, you get the signals, there's, there could be uh, reactions to anything, like to an inner state, to another person, to an algorithmic system, to a current event, so you don't know. That's the first problem. Um, the second problem is you always retrieve both signals and entities. You don't choose entities or target population members and then you go and get their signals. You usually have both at the same time. The signals are, they, sometimes you even start with the signals and then you get the entities attached to them. Yeah? That's the other huge difference that you have. So that's uh, also a huge challenge. So that's how it looks like, um, how we came up with it. What we did here, we did it a little bit different. We have measurement and representation parts, but we also, we um, basically designed it in a way that we have in the middle the different decisions that the researcher makes and then what results from this, what kind of errors result from this. Yeah? So that's the logic here. But we still uh, clearly uh, distinguish between measurement and representation errors. So to keep in, uh, in line with the uh, TSE, the total survey error framework. And in the end, arriving at the estimate for the target population again. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take an example study, uh, running example, and basically walk you through how this would look like. So how would a researcher study influenza prevalence in the national population using digital traces? So we start with construct definition, and this we could have also called, if it would have fit in the bubble, uh, construct definition and linking to ideal measurement, basically. Because what you do here is you think about what is your construct, define it clearly, and then you think about how you ideally would measure this in a perfect world. Um, you do not directly put it into something in a, like in a survey because you can't. Like you have to explore the whole data first. You cannot immediately design a survey. So that's a little bit different from the construct definition in surveys. But here, let's say the construct is pretty, pretty easy. It's like if I have vir influenza viruses in my body, then this is a true positive, yeah? And then I asked, so how, what, what possibly can I have in digital traces? And we use now social media and Google as a search engine. What possible signals could I have that tell me if a person has the flu? And I think about, for example, queries uh, that are related to the flu. I throw that with, with a keyword, for example, um, flu-related information like views that are um, sent, uh, appear on Wikipedia pages that are uh, somehow related to influenza um, or posts on Twitter about having a flu. Yeah? And I check if what I'm measuring with this is actually, I do, do all, go through all these kinds of validity checks, like is that, am I measuring a different construct? If I'm measuring the construct that I want to, what could be the potential noise, et cetera, et cetera. And if I do that wrong, for example, I, I just simply say every time someone says fever, they have the flu, I'm already doing a validity error here, yeah? Because that's possi not possibly true. Or if someone says Trump and one negative word, then they hate Trump, yeah? Um, this is, of course, linked to the construct definition and questionnaire design in, in surveys, but it's not exactly the same thing. But very, uh, yeah, uh, you could align it with this. So that's the first step. The second step would be I select a platform. And of course, in reality, that's not how it works. In an ideal world, again, in an ideal world, I would define a construct and then I go to the platforms, but you already see that, I mean, you already seen, I have to think about the platform and how the platform looks like when I define a construct. So we could have also drawn this next to each other, but this builds on this basically in some way. So what you do, um, to go to the platform, oh, this is my slide is out of order. Okay. 
Um, let me tell you, tell you about the potential remedies for validity issues. Some of them that could be applied and people have tried these. So here we always put the potential remedies and then we put uh, the, uh, some, some uh, literature pointers. So of course you have, the first thing you have to do, you have to really go into, into the field that you're looking at, for example, for example, uh, immunology or, uh, or medicine, and you have to think, or psychology, like how would someone express depression, for example, or having an illness, yeah? Um, that's the first thing you have to do. The second thing, if you have, or someone else did it, you can actually look at interviews or focus groups, how people would actually divulge information like this on Twitter, to build a good understanding of how people actually would do this. Um, and the second thing, which is a very sensitive, what people have tried, is actually link offline and online uh, people with their online accounts to see if they're sick, what do they actually do online, yeah? That's another, so you actually look at people, at, at, at actual people that you have and their link on Twitter and you see what they actually do when they get sick or when they get unemployed. That's another possible remedy, but very hard to get and very tricky in terms of privacy. Uh, and then you, you need to select your platform you basically have to think about uh, different affordance errors. So what you have to do is two things of affordance errors. So the, you have to think about this. You have the person that's sitting there and you have the platform in between and it distorts the signal towards you. And how does it do that? So the first way is of distorting the expression of the people that are on the platform. So Twitter only allows 280 characters before it allowed much less. Um, Google gives you a recommendation for your search queries when you start typing. That probably changes the behavior of the people. Um, um, and uh, it, it, or Google, uh, Twitter also has trending tweets. So if someone wants to write about something completely different and then they see influenza is trending, then maybe they go there and then they feel the need to express themselves, which they have, wouldn't have done before. So that's uh, the, distorting of, the distortion of expression of signals. The other thing is sometimes uh, signals are not, getting, not even getting recorded. So people, Google does probably not record, I'm not sure, they don't, certainly don't share it. If you click backspace once you started typing, or if someone clicked on a, on a link, wanted to reply, and then went back, yeah? Um, and plus, they don't share everything they record. So either um, it's aggregated in some, it's, it's, you get loose information because it's aggregated, or it's simply not given, yeah? So for example, uh, Wikipedia gives you the the, the click streams over all pages in aggregate, like hold the stream of people navigate, but not for single people. Of privacy reasons, of course, it makes sense, but this is one way of where the platform affordance or the decisions that the platform makes distort the signal. And that could be uh, linked to in the TSE to the, to the response collection, like if you choose telephone, I also get a distortion and how I get the signals back. That would be a link that you can do to the TSE. It's basically the gap between the true signals and the distortion by the platform. By the way, it could also be just community standards. Like people do not appreciate you talking about politics on platform X. That is also a distortion through, through the platform. There's a platform affordance errors that's basically in the community. Yeah? Or terms of service don't allow talking about a specific thing. Potential remedies could be you quantify the effect of a feature where there's non-existence. So you could look, there are papers that looked at uh, what happens when Twitter changed their, their, the, the, the limit of characters that they allowed and they saw that people started or the, the, that people write more or, or potentially write more also if you to get the, the, the visual um, window length would, would change without the character uh, limit actually changing also people would start writing longer or shorter tweets or you could look at other things like there's a recommendation engine and there's none yeah so if you find these natural experiments, that is one way you can test this. And then you can look up if other people have quantified them. Um, and then, of course, people do technical solutions uh, in like engineering around the sharing problems, uh, where, where a platform would not share everything. For Twitter, you probably also have uh, heard of, of like things, inofficial APIs or something like this. So that's another way of going around the affordances of sharing, basically. Yeah? Uh, the affordances of recording, you cannot go around because, I mean, they're just not recorded. Okay. Another error you have is, is coverage error. So this was basically even for one single person, you get the signals wrong, right? So you get the signals wrong because they're just not recorded in a way, for example, or they were, they were influenced. The other thing is the coverage error is the population of the people that are actually on the platform. And everybody knows that there's self-selection on Twitter or on, 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 on Facebook. I think everybody has heard, has heard about that. Um, yeah, more young people, more well-educated people in some services, et cetera, et cetera. So 
that is a typical coverage error. So it's basically the gap between the target population and the thing that you want that you get from the from the platform. Um, that's a pretty pretty straightforward one, um, and it's very very uh, similar to the coverage error. If you select your sampling frame, let's say your census, and the misalignment between the target population and what you have here, also very very similar. Remedies, uh, reweighting in a later step would be the thing, like you also do in non-probabilistic surveys. Um, or you think about using multiple platforms, actually. Um, or not doing a found data thing altogether and actually approaching people uh, in another way. But if you want to use found data, then these were the two main things you could try to use. And there are uh, researchers that increasingly also give you some kind of weighting factors that do experiments on, on with the Facebook marketing API or we did one with inclusion probabilities on Twitter so you can actually see in certain counties even on county level what the for different strata what the joining probabilities are and you actually can get reweighting uh, uh, yeah, can weights basically for reweighting so that was construct definition and platform selection so here on the left side you have problems for me, what measure what I'm actually want or do from my, my signals, and here's what I misrepresent the, the the population, and then I go to data collection. So now I say I'll, I chose Twitter, and now I'm, or let's say I chose something with a completely open API, and it can, could possibly get everything I want. Yeah. Um, then I have to choose what do I actually want, and what people often do, what researchers often do, is only getting those signals, first signals, and entities that are interesting to the research question. Yeah often is, is a volume question. It's also a question of like, I don't need these signals and entities, but it's also a volume question often with these kind of data. I cannot possibly process all of that. And I don't need to. So why would I download it from the API, for example, or stream it out of this huge zip archive? Um, so then you do something, usually, often people do something like retrieve tweets with keywords. So for the influenza uh, example, it's like influenza vaccine um, and something else for, for uh, Wikipedia could be the center for disease control page and so on and so on and so on or uh, also for tweets and inside the tweets and uh, do a, a broad as a collection as they can so that it still fits into a machine basically that's what, what often happens um, there you can miss simply miss stuff so if your recall is not high enough your precision might be good but if your recall is not high enough then you miss, miss things that are not as maybe on the nose as like a hashtag that says I hate Hillary or something like this, or I hate Trump, but uh, you miss, miss the subtle points of, of tweets or subtle, subtle signals that you could actually get. Sometimes that's not that bad, but you really, have, really always have to do the trade-off. But if you miss some, that is a signal selection error, as we call it. You miss signals that you would actually need. Um, it's, it, that is somehow similar to the response collection uh, when you actually reach out to people to get the response that they basically don't answer or don't answer truthfully. Um, what you can do for signal selection error, so you can, you can do, for example, a, a random query, uh, a random selection of, of the platform and see if you miss something, like go through it and like hand annotate it or go qualitatively, qualitatively through it and see if you miss something with the query that you used. Or um, um, you do something like query expansion where you basically start, then you look into the tweet, you see, oh yeah, that's also a good keyword for that topic that I totally missed with my initial selection, and I add that to my query uh, collection and I query more, and I repeat this. There are even people that, uh, researchers that uh, already uh, develop machine learning, active learning approaches to do this, so you, you can actually uh, get help in what kind of queries you should probably, or what kind of words you should probably choose to get a better a selection of tweets or other social media signals. So these are things you could do. Um, then in terms of representation, so what I did before, I only got the tweets in English, for example. So that is an entity selection error, selecting the accounts or the profiles on Twitter um, because I only select a certain signal. So a signal selection always entails, or often entails an entity selection problem or entity selection. Yeah? If I only choose people that use the, this specific hashtag, I will probably only probably get younger people or people that actually use hashtags. So that's a problem that is induced by, by the signal selection and goes to entity selection. So here, on, if I use, for example, English tweets only, I will only get English-speaking uh, residents of the US. I will not get this, uh, the big Spanish-speaking population of the US, which makes me miss a lot of influenza cases. Yeah? 
Um, that is one that is introduced through the signal selection. But you can also, of course, have something where you select profiles, for example, directly by looking at, let's say, the photo or looking at the self-divulged uh, demographic information. Like, I'm a dad of two, uh, 32 years old, and you can also do it like that, or random sample the entities and then go from there to the, to the signals. Yeah? That's another form of entity selection error you can do. But the former one is actually, I would say, much even more dominant in, in research that you look at the signals that are relevant and then you may exclude people that do not use this specific format of expressing that signal. Yeah, potential remedies is you access the characteristics of the entity in included in the data. If you play around with the queries, you see, um, you look, for example, at the attributes that you can get from the profiles. If you slightly change this, like if you don't use that specific tweet uh, hashtag, do I get actually a more, um, more broad uh, uh, array of, of profiles back? And if I look at them, could be with, with the manual inspection, do I actually get more things that, more profiles that look older or of older people or, or less uh, economic, in, in a lower economic status, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and of course, also this can to some extent be addressed in, in adjustment later. Um, if you have the attributes, like not always do you have the attributes, especially on Twitter or something or another, like think about Reddit or anything where you just have a username, you cannot reweight until you have actual attributes, that's also a huge problem. Yeah, you don't know if someone is male, female, or how old they are. Okay, good. So that was the first three steps and how they uh, affect what you're selecting. And then uh, Indira will do the fourth one. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so now we're at the fourth step. So that's data pre-processing. Uh, so I would just like to point out that data pre-processing uh, is the stage uh, where you do a lot of things, like a lot of small uh, things that say you collected too much data. Maybe you cast your net quite wide and uh, you have a lot of data, some of which include noisy signals and entities which should not be there. And at this step, you might filter them out. Another thing that you could also do during pre-processing is augment some of the information that you have. You can augment your signals and entities with uh, extra information, uh, such as the demographic in, uh, information that Fabian ju was just talking about. Uh, so let's see what kind of augmentation we would do with the signals. Uh, so in this uh, example, going back to flu, what we might do is uh, augment our tweets with uh, syntactic or grammatical or lexical features uh, that might help us uh, understand whether uh, the speaker is currently having the flu or not. Uh, so again, this is not the stage where you tell if the person has the flu or not. That's the next step that happens in data analysis. Here you kind of... Uh, get some extra features that would tell you in that step whether that person has the flu or not. So in this example, you could get parts of speech tags um, or dependency uh, parsing that would tell you if uh, this tweet is in present tense. Uh, and then you can say that at this time period, this person reported being sick. And um, you could hand code that, but although this is uh, large scale data and that would not uh, be feasible, uh, so you would likely uh, rely on some machine coding. Uh, the other thing that was removing uh, some of the information that you think is noisy, so for example, uh, um, this is a tweet which uh, warns people that fear-mongering about the flu is actually uh, not a good idea and uh, it can cause undue panic. Uh, it doesn't tell me whether this person has the flu or not. So that way, this is also an ineligible signal that I shouldn't include because it's not uh, useful for me in measuring uh, influenza prevalence. And again, I would uh, use some uh, machine uh, or model or heuristics to maybe filter this out. So depending on the methods that I use for each of these steps, we could get a signal augmentation error or a signal reduction error. Because again, none of these methods are perfect. Even humans aren't uh, perfect. Sometimes there can be disagreement uh, between what constitutes as right uh, lexical units. Um, therefore, um, 
you get these errors and um, that's okay. It's still good to document them. Um, and this has a very, this has a, a more or less quite clear counterpart in the TSE. That's the uh, processing or the coding error that happens when you look at survey responses and you perhaps throw out uh, what you think are uh, people who have just uh, entered the survey randomly uh, by checking the C field all the time. Um, so what are the potential remedies for uh, data pr signal pre-processing? Uh, one thing to do could be to take a held out uh, data set, maybe uh, hand annotate some 100 or 200 posts uh, and assess how your methods do on them. Uh, and one thing to especially keep in mind in digital traces is that many of these uh, text methods have not been developed for social media languages. Many of these lexicons that exist uh, were uh, for media or newspapers uh, that do not, that are much more structured than social media languages. So there could be a domain mismatch. Uh, so this assessment could tell you if that's the case and if you should update some of these tools or uh, build a tool that's specific for the domain of study you want. So that was, that was how pre-processing can affect uh, the construct being measured. Uh, pre-processing methods can also affect uh, whether your estimate is uh, representative or not, or, or rather if they are generalizable or not. Uh, so as we saw, uh, it might be useful at this stage to augment entities with demographic information and um, there are lots of tools for doing that. Uh, there are lots of commercial APIs. You can use um, some of the self-reported textual information that's already there. Some people use the images people uh, put up. So there are many methods for demographic augmentation. Um, in this case, uh, entity reduction would involve getting rid of some uh, entities that you think are not again, representative of your sample. So those would be uh, messages from bots or what you assume, uh, or organizations perhaps. So depending on the methods that you choose for this, you would run into entity augmentation and entity reduction error. And specifically talking about entity augmentation error, so this is a pretty seminal paper that um, showed that some of these commercial APIs have errors, which is natural. Again, um, tools cannot be perfect, but what this paper actually showed was uh, not only are these methods error prone, they're actually biased. So going back to the uh, discussion we had about errors being simple deviations, whereas biases being systematic uh, deviations, this paper showed that many of these commercial APIs uh, tend to have a high chance of misgendering black women. And that's very problematic if you use some of these methods. Uh, in this influenza example, it could be that um, you find, uh, it could be that the data shows that, uh, or the data actually says that black women have a higher susceptibility to the flu, but because you use some of these tools, it just says that it's actually black men. And um, that's very problematic, and that's the entity augmentation error. Similarly, entity reduction error, um, perhaps it's not that problematic or maybe it's not been studied uh, in that much detail yet, but uh, methods for removing bots uh, are not perfect, but they're also not always up to date. Bot detection is kind of like an arms race where uh, as you develop detection systems, bots learn how to evade them as well, or bot creators learn how to evade them as well. So a bot detection system that was perhaps working really well, had an accuracy of 90% in 2017, might not be as effective uh, uh, in 2020. So these are things to keep in mind. Uh, and again, a few potential remedies could be very similar to how you deal with signal pre-processing, assess the methods that you have, look at the different strengths uh, of the methods. Uh, if it's possible that one method works really well uh, for text, whereas another method works well for images, maybe you can combine them. Uh, another suggestion for demographic inference specifically is to use self-reported data. 
uh, where you see what kind of profile, what kind of pronouns uh, a person has listed on their Twitter account. Um, this would give you very good data. Definitely, uh, it would make it very aligned with surveys. But then this also has problems when it comes to coverage because maybe not that many people do this. Uh, so yeah, that was data pre-processing. And now we finally get to the last step of our research pipeline. Um, and the first thing that you do during data analysis is here, given a set of tweets from one person, you say whether this person has the flu or not, in this case, in, in our example. So you could do that uh, in many method, in many ways. You could count the number of tweets they have to create complicated machine learning models. Um, so in this example, this person has tweeted three times about having the flu uh, over the course of the week. Now, is that three instances of the flu or did this person uh, uh, suffer the flu once and it went over the week? Um, so depending on how you model this information or how you aggregate some of these signals, you could end up with a signal measurement error. Um, and how is signal measurement error related with the TSE? So this is an interesting point uh, where you can't really find an exact counterpoint in the TSE, but uh, it's broadly, broadly related with validity because when you're designing your questionnaire, uh, you would make it much more clear uh, that did you have the, uh, how many times did you suffer these system, symptoms over the week? And that is something that we cannot control in digital traces and we have to rely on our assumptions. Um, so it kind of relates to the first part or the validity part uh, in TSE. And remedies for this, uh, potential remedies for this could be to conduct a meta-analysis of the different aggregation methods that were tried out uh, in past literature, uh, see how different um, methods of modeling actually affected the estimate. Uh, and the other suggestion could be to consult a domain expert. In this case, that would be either a med medical professional or perhaps uh, an epidemiologist. And now we come to the last step of the last step. So that's uh, adjustment in data analysis. Um, so here we would like to do adjustment because of some of the representation errors uh, that we uh, encountered or incurred during our research. So this is heavily inspired by survey and it's uh, survey research and it's kind of gaining traction in digital traces now uh, where researchers have tried to mitigate uh, the representativity of Twitter data, of Facebook data, by uh, adjusting it or realigning it with census data. The unfortunate part is that sometimes trying to correct for some of these representation issues might cause uh, another representation issue or the adjustment error in this case. Uh, depending on the variables that you use, so for example, in this case, we could look at location for the flu example. Uh, is picking location enough to explain the self-selection of uh, these platform users or are there more variables involved? So there's a question of the number of variables that uh, we should use for uh, adjustment. There's also the matter of different methods that can be used for readjustment. So um, there are quite a few methods as from raking to inverse propensity weighting, which have uh, all been studied in a lot of detail in survey methodology. But since um, did, uh, this work with digital traces is kind of new, we still haven't explored that yet. So we don't know which scenarios are actually ideal for which kind of weighting method. Uh, and this has a very clear counterpart with the TSE, that's the adjustment error. So potential remedies here could be to learn uh, from survey research, look at uh, some of the literature there about which scenarios uh, have, uh, recommend, have recommendations for which kind of uh, re uh, adjustment methods, look at the variables that we have available and see which combination would give us uh, the ideal, uh, the least amount of adjustment error. 
So that was uh, the TED, TED, the error framework or, of digital traces of humans. So these small red boxes tell you uh, the errors that we had for this particular case of understanding influenza prevalence from digital traces. Uh, and the idea is that TED can help you uh, decompose the errors at every stage and write them down um, and document them so that your study uh, is more transparent as well as more comparable with studies which use digital traces but also studies which use surveys. Um, so there, there's also a factor that we um, did not explicitly talk about but perhaps uh, some pointers on that about the effect of time. Uh, and so drift is a term that Matt Selganik uses in his book Bit by Bit, and he defines these three different types of drift, system drift, population drift, and behavioral drift. So uh, when your platform changes, when your platform affordances changes, such as um, going from 140 to 280 characters, is a study that's being done now comparable with a study that was done when the affordances were different? Uh, so that's that's uh, the idea of system drift. Uh, there's also population drift. So, for example, the early adopters of Twitter uh, probably do not have the same demographic makeup of the current uh, Twitter population. So, again, how, how would you compare some of these studies that were done maybe five years ago? Uh, another uh, another uh, thing that can also happen is behavioral drift. So... Language is constantly changing. We're coming up with new terms. Terms are changing in meaning. And um, it's also very, uh, very prevalent in the case of social media with the uh, usage of new slang all the time. So there's also a certain amount of behavioral drift which affects uh, how we collect our signals. So perhaps queries that were useful five years ago may not be as useful now. So that's the impact of time. Um, so the next state would be to apply the error framework to another case study that, um, that has usually been studied using surveys, but perhaps before we go to that, uh, we can have some time for a few questions. Um, yeah, I think um, it's not ideal. Um, it, the ideal case would be if we could have that high level of confidence, but perhaps that's not always possible uh, in uh, social media data. But um, the other option would be to then find com ways of combining digital traces with um, survey data, for example, web tracking, where you have uh, the behavioral data, so you combine the strengths of both of them. So you have the behavioral uh, data, which gives you very strong signals, uh, whereas you have the demographic information, things that are very hard to infer from surveys itself. So, yeah. But I think it's a very good point. So that there's, there's new, so like, for example, gender, like if you annotate gender for a Twitter profile, in the survey you would know, you would ask the person, or the sexual identity, whatever, and they would give it to you. I guess that's what you also mean, right? And then you're short. That's it. Done. Highly in, confident. Right? Yeah. In, in, uh, we did a paper, for example, where we had a deep learning model. And then you have a softmax in the end. And the softmax tells you, I'm still that confident that this is a woman. Yeah? Like I have 90 or 95 or something like this. It's so like you could now, and we did a thresholding. So we basically, like people do, I mean, you did a threshold and you say, okay, so that's probably a woman, that's a man. And we go. And the other ones, we basically, we don't have a signal for them. But you could also put that into your reweighting model, like in your post certification or whatever you do afterwards. And that is something that's also underexplored. We didn't do it, but that's something, for example, that is new, kind of, like the uncertainty in the signal to include it in the modeling. Um, and that's a very good point. That's a 
totally underexplored and would be very, very, very interesting. Like, I mean, when I reweight, do I reweight this person where I'm not sure, where I'm 50 50? Do I actually, how do I reweight them, for example? Yeah, it's a good point. I guess yeah. along those lines, um, it feels like some of this use of digital traces is sort of closer to experiments, which you brought up at the beginning, because there you might be able to control for something, run an AB test, but you can't set things up and ask people what their gender or what how they sort of identify. And so again, you might have to infer it from what you can measure. So I guess what I haven't, well, I, I don't know, but is there also sort of value in, in looking at how this would apply to experiments or sort of how it's Sure, sure. I mean, um, in experiment, I guess in the experiment, you even have more control about what you're collecting and might. So I'm, I, in the experiments, you basically, when you're in the lab, you set up everything and you, you provide the stimulus. So you're right. In some, like we have some cases in digital traces where you have a natural experiment where you have this where the feature was there and the feature was not there. But that's not the, the, that's not the rule. I mean, that's when you're lucky enough, you find this. But usually. I would say it's more closely related to surveys in a sense that um, you go out and you have this kind of this selection of people and they provide you with a certain uh, certain information after you give them a stimulus. Yeah, I guess from experiments you could also learn. I mean, natural experiments for sure. Yeah, but in, in general, I, I don't I see more a connection to the actually to the survey how the survey uh, error is approached than than uh, what it, how it's done in experiments. I would say. Um, could you comment on the drift that you talked about on the last slide? Um, what are possible remedies against these? Maybe just name a few of them. And then maybe you can comment on what are good research questions to use digital traces for because of those drifts. As you said, that uh, vocabulary change, for instance. Um, what kind of questions are good for them? Yeah. Um, so I think um, if you sort of think of drifts as features instead of bugs, uh, perhaps digital traces are very good at understanding some of these drifts. So how uh, does language change over time? And there's some really cool work that does that to see, uh, um, especially if you have like very nice longitudinal data by snapshot, such as uh, Reddit data from 10 years ago and uh, yearly data and see how certain languages evolve. Um, that's, that's one experiment I would say which also tells you a lot about how society is evolving. Um, Fabian, if you... Yeah, I mean sometimes the error is also the signal. I mean it depends on what you're studying. If you're studying the effect of, of, a, of a software change then that's your that's your signal. Yeah, so that's um, and the other thing, how you would address this, I guess, even if you are measuring at one point, you have to be aware of all these drifts. Like if you know that that feature has changed, then you have to treat the population or the signals before that change, of course, differently than those that occurred later. Um, and that is something, um, yeah, that, that can also be a chance to to study to study the uh, impact of certain uh, features on. So, for example, now Twitter is thinking of uh, introducing different ways of replying to tweets. So, perhaps a thinking of that as a natural experiment, seeing how people communicated before and how people communicate after that change as well. And then you have to disentangle it from the behavioral one. You basically say that these are not the same cohorts on Twitter right now that where they are five years ago, right? These are younger people. They have more digital literacy, for example. They know better how to deal with these. So that. At least thinking about this makes it uh, makes it easier to know if now the feature was in, was the so you then probably you can say something like okay then let's choose someone who was on Twitter for six years already and throw away all the other ones just to control for the effect for example just thinking about these kind of drifts that can occur helps you to maybe set up some counterfactuals some counter experiments where you can see if that actually happens or not what you think happens and so I guess we have one more question. I just have a small uh, practical question. Do you plan on making the slides available? 
Um, yes. <laughs> and yes. So, because <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a, I found it a very nice uh, synthesis of, you know, many things that one might be aware kind of, but they are tend to be scattered around. So I think that's a great job to put it all together and, uh, you know, in a very well, uh, you know, didactically structured way. <laughs> so I have a self-interest <laughs> behind my question, <laughs> which is the second part in terms of uh, um, acceptable uses of the slide. Uh, how would you feel about uh, parts of it being used in teaching classes and what kind sure. of attribution would you be happy with? Well, we have a Open source. Um. When you, I mean, uh, that's also more, a little bit more detailed than the slides. Yes, it's at the very end. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so yes, the slides are already up on our microsite. Um, so you can see them there. Uh, some more information after this. So um, perhaps we can just quickly go over the case study and yeah, sure. discuss some of the questions after that, if that's okay. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, so this is the last stage uh, where we apply our framework to a case study that's. Uh, been heavily explored with surveys uh, and to see how, uh, how the parallels emerge between the two paradigms. And that's understanding presidential approval, uh, something that's been done with surveys for a very long time, uh, for more than 50 years, in fact, uh, to the extent that the question for uh, surveying people about this has remained unchanged for decades. Um, but another interesting thing about presidential approval is that it was also one of the first, um, one of the first few use cases that was explored to see if uh, social media data, particularly Twitter data, uh, could complement polls uh, and surveys. So uh, this is the paper at the bottom by uh, O'Connor and colleagues from 10 years ago in ICWSM. And uh, since then, there have been many more uh, analysis and studies to see uh, how presidential approval uh, can be inferred from digital traces and if uh, some of these estimates align or not. So we are going to summarize some of the um, work and takeaways from these uh, papers. Uh, but before we turn to digital traces, so uh, just a quick glance at how presidential approval is understood through surveys. So this is the question that I was uh, talking about. Uh, do you approve or disapprove of the way president name is handling his job as president? So in this case, that's Donald Trump. And uh, you ask this question to what is ideally a uh, representative uh, sample of the American adult population. Uh, and then um, you see whether uh, how many of them approve and how many of them disapprove, and that gives you uh, the approval rates uh, per day. So how would a researcher do this uh, if they were to do it with uh, Twitter? Um, so they would first start off by defining the construct into an ideal or envisioned measurement. Uh, and uh, in this case, the construct is presidential approval. It's latent. You can't see a person and uh, know if they approve or disapprove of Trump. So you have to find a concrete uh, manifestation of this in how they behave. Uh, so one way of doing that would be to see tweets. Uh, about Donald Trump, which have either negative or positive sentiment, uh, which would be then indicative of approval or disapproval, respectively. And that seems like a sensible uh, measurement. It can still have issues of validity, though. Uh, so again, let's revisit the question that's there in surveys. So that's, that explicitly lists how Donald Trump is handling his job as president as a part of this question. And that is not included in our, me in our envisioned measurement. So the way we define our construct is perhaps too broad. And that can cause issues of validity, because then you have uh, tweets about Trump related to his personal life, his business dealings, his work as a reality TV show personality. And all of that can distort some of the signals being measured. Uh, the next step, so I mean, again, this, is, this does not happen in a linear fashion most of the time, like platform selection we're saying happens after construct definition, but kind of in defining the measurement, we've, we've already chosen our platform. Uh, and when we choose Twitter, 
Uh, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with Twitter, know about Twitter's affordances, know that the terms of services uh, somewhat dictates what you can or cannot say on the platform. Uh, it has these uh, lists or uh, rankings of trending hashtags, um, depending on the time and place. Um, it also has all of these activities that you can do, such as liking, retweeting, quoting. So all of these platforms, Twitter affordances, uh, Twitter's platform affordances can affect uh, how people express themselves or uh, uh, express their signals or induce signals about presidential approval, ultimately affecting the way we end up measuring some of these signals. Um, so uh, that would then be the platform affordance error. Um, on the other hand, in choosing Twitter, we also incur a coverage error or a representation error because Twitter's uh, platform population is simply uh, not aligned with the US adult population. So this um, 2009 study from Pew Research, uh, sorry, yes. It's very recent. Um, uh, this recent study showed that US uh, uh, adult Twitters tend to be more left-leaning, uh, and they also tend to be younger uh, than the average American. Uh, so, And that gives you the platform coverage error. So now you go to data collection. Uh, in data collection, you explicitly specify which uh, keywords or um, uh, hashtags, perhaps, that you would use. So, you, this is a very simple case, so we just go with Trump uh, to illuminate some of these errors. Uh, but of course, there can be more uh, complicated and more effective queries. Uh, so in this case, Trump, uh, when using the keyword Trump, uh, I, we, were, we might end up getting two of these tweets. Uh, so the first tweet is about Trump Tower, which is not the Trump Tower in New York and is therefore not affiliated with Donald Trump. And the second uh, tweet is about uh, Eric Trump being an idiot. And um, these are two tweets that are both noisy for different reasons. So the first is completely unrelated to Trump, whereas the second one uh, is about Donald Trump's family. And while that can implicitly affect um, Donald, Trump, Donald Trump's job as president, it's not uh, an explicit indica indication of uh, disapproval. So that would be the signal selection error. Um, on the other hand, uh, the queries that you curate might also lead to uh, a representation error. So in this example, um, there could be nicknames that pe certain people use for Trump. So one is uh, one of them could be Orange Cheeto, um, which, as you can probably tell from the name, most of his detractors use. And uh, if you don't consider such nicknames, uh, then there's a likelihood you would miss out on a lot of criticism directed towards Trump. And uh, your fi final estimate would likely not be representative of the uh, US population. And that would be the entity selection error. Now we come to data pre-processing. Uh, for this case, we might want to use a sentiment lexicon that annotates some of the uh, negative and positive words in a tweet. So uh, uh, this tweet particularly seems to be uh, seems to be negative because it has a higher uh, number of negative words. Um, so you would think that this tweet is probably uh, disapproving of Trump. But if you look closely, this uh, negative sentiment is actually directed to Elizabeth Warren. And given that these um, sentiment lexicons uh, are target independent, like they, they cannot tell you who is actually uh, the target of the sentiment being expressed, uh, you end up with a signal augmentation error. Now, when it comes to signal reduction, uh, you might think that tweets like this, which do not have any textual content, uh, which is basically a lot of mentions and some images, perhaps this is not something that's signaling approval or disapproval. Um, but if you look at the images, uh, then they do have text embedded in them and they could have some signals uh, that are useful for understanding approval or disapproval. So if you don't consider this tweet, uh, you run into a data pre-processing error. 
oh, sorry, a signal reduction error. Um, so data pre-processing also involves augmenting and um, reducing some of the entities that we have. Uh, this is very, uh, this is almost identical to the case of flu because um, this is about augmenting or pre-processing your entities for a particular platform, Twitter, which likely does not depend on the construct being measured. So uh, if you're measuring flu, you would probably still do entity augmentation the same way as you would if you were me uh, measuring presidential approval. So you use whatever methods of entity augmentation, such as maybe commercial APIs, or just look at the self-disclosed uh, gender words, uh, and depending on how effective your model is, you get an entity augmentation error. Um, on the other hand, you could also uh, get rid of the bots. Uh, and again, very similar to uh, entity reduction error as we saw before, uh, depending on how effective your bot detection method is. And now finally, we come to data pre-processing. So at this stage, uh, given a person's tweets, we would like to know whether this person uh, approves or disapproves of Trump or not. So this is one person who has tweeted twice in a day about Trump. And uh, it could be that uh, one of his tweets is positive, whereas the next one is negative. So how do we measure that? Do we take the average of that? So positive, negative kind of cancels each other out and you end up with a neutral, uh, neutral sentiment? Or do we take the most frequent case? So there are different ways in which we could aggregate this signal. And depending on how we do that, we get a signal measurement error. And now we come to data analysis, uh, data analysis again, uh, where we do adjustment. Uh, so in adjustment, we would like to deal with the platform coverage error as well as the entity selection error or generally the representation errors that we got. Um, so there are multiple ways in which this has been explored in the literature as well. Uh, some researchers have uh, augmented some of this demographic information either uh, by linking it with offline records, which is again highly sensitive information. Um, so they have a fairly confident assessment of the demographic attributes of their sample, and then they compared that with the target population's demographic uh, makeup and did the adjustment. Uh, another method that researchers have also done is instead of reweighting their own estimates, they've reweighted the survey estimates by Twitter's demographic uh, information and then see if uh, these estimates align or not, because then it would tell you uh, if demographic, if reweighting is good enough for dealing with some of these representation issues. Now, there, the assumption is that Twitter's uh, demographic makeup is the same as our sample's demographic makeup, which might not be true because when we used queries, uh, when we used particular queries such as Trump, so people who use the keyword Trump may not be the same people uh, as who use Twitter as a whole. They could be more politically vocal. There's a higher chance that they are probably minorities. Um, so. Uh, that assumption might then lead to adjustment error. Um, so again, that's the uh, total error framework for digital traces of humans. Um, to conclude, what it can help you with is uh, it can simultaneously act as a set of guidelines for uh, designing research, uh, d designing research pipelines, uh, but also as a way for documenting some of the research uh, that we have. So, um, data sheets for data sets uh, is one example where uh, you can document some of the issues with data sets. Uh, similarly, model cards for model reporting. Um, are one way of reporting the issues with pre-trained models. So very similarly, this framework can help you create specification sheets for uh, your findings or for general research study. Uh, so some of the specification sheets that uh, could uh, come up from this uh, might look like this, where you explicitly say what the construct is, uh, and uh, ex the small explanations of the different kinds of errors, 
uh, and the different sources of errors, like whether they are measurement errors or representation errors. Um, and so, yeah, these are some of the references that we used in our uh, tutorial today. And again, these slides uh, are already up. Um, so yes, then we end this tutorial with uh, the last few takeaways. This is uh, our working paper that's available on this link. Uh, it has more detailed explanations about the error framework that we studied. It also talks about how it relates to the total survey error framework. And yes, thank you for listening. And now, we'd, if you have any questions, we'd love to know. So um, for a lot of the machine learning researchers that sort of most frequently start with just a data set and very little information, um, I'm, like, I'm just curious uh, how much information you think they can really get um, by like, being really smart about how they look at just the data and then how much it helps to have like, the data sheets, the, like, that sort of information, and if that's even enough, and if you could like, yeah, does that, does that make sense as a question? understand what the kind of errors are just from looking at the data, I mean. Yeah, yeah. So if you're interested in understanding the systemic errors or systemic biases <coughs> in your data, I'm curious like to what extent you feel like, oh, there's actually a lot of great tests to to that you can do that are just based on looking at the data and how many like what like how useful that is compared to how useful you can like start to, how useful you can start to answer that question if you have something like the data set for data sheets like uh, Tim Neat's type of information about the background of the data set. So I guess you can only, yeah, I mean, you have to understand what your, how your data was produced. Um, I'm not sure, like, I'm not sure, like, um, what you, what you would, do you ask questions only looking at the data, understanding what the different errors could be? Or is that, the, is that the question? Uh, I mean, like, quantifying the biases. I mean, I just think it's such a common machine learning problem that, like, all you have is the data set. And I'm curious, do you, like, if, it, it sounds like you think, like, well, there's not, that much that's interesting to you that you could answer based on just looking at the data and ask and like doing various like quantitative tests on it. Like it seems like you really think that you get a ton more from having like the data set data sheet and maybe even more that is left off of the sheet, but you would know if you had done the entire process. Um, it sounds like maybe that's what your answer to my question is. Yeah. <laughs> it, my, it's like my attempt, um, <laughs> like, right? No, yeah, that's that's sure, certainly. And I think. Yeah, so having this data sheet already helps a lot. And then I guess you can also, I mean, if you have any idea of what you possibly, I mean, it already helps to have an empty data sheet and actually just thinking about how you would fill that out probably for that, for that, for that data set that you're in, it's in front of you where you have no further information on. You basically, then you challenge yourself with filling that out and you basically say, okay, what is what could be a representation error here? And then you maybe start subsetting, for example, certain parts. Uh, if you try to find out, at, at least with some, like with a commercial, like with, with Phrase++ or some, some solution you have on the photos, and you actually see, okay, even with that imperfect measure of who's male or female, for example, can I already see extreme biases in how they, for example, uh, express certain features? Is that something that happened here? Like, just ac asking the right questions, I think, is where, where that already helps you. Um, uh, and then, I guess, yeah, you basically just, just and it always helps to also have an idea how the collection was actually done. Like, like really go ask the question, like, see who collected this and under what, what circumstances, uh, what were the query terms to actually get that data from somewhere, and when was it collected. So that's all questions you, I guess, that helps you to ask in the first place, if I answered that question at least to some extent. <laughs> so I, I would just add that, uh, like, if you have a data set and you also have the corresponding data sheet, I think, um, that also tells you about uh, what the construct, the researchers who released that data set wanted to study, uh, but perhaps it doesn't tell you some of the related constructs that you could also study. So for example, um, if you have a hate speech uh, data set, uh, could you also uh, study sexism for that? That's perhaps not something you would 
uh, just get from the data sheet. You would have to maybe go through this and uh, like sort of a research you think uh, and think of the different other sub dimensions of sexism that are not captured by hate speech alone. And then you would have to envision that study and perhaps this can help you uh, in that to see what other uh, ways that data set can be used in. I think this is also a super important question for all the benchmarks that are out there in NLP, like senti bench or whatever. And they, you basically have this thing that says this is a sentiment in towards this direction, but there's one that says this is hate speech. And you, there you really have to ask those questions because that, that is, I, fi I find that personally very dangerous to just take it at face value and then just run against it and then say, okay, I'm good at detecting hate speech and I'm done because if there's no documentation of why this, how this was created, to what purpose, um, I think that's really a responsibility we also have if we, if we develop methods and, and run them. I can ask one more question if no yeah. one else sure. has one. Um, so I guess kind of relatedly then, um, once you have this data and you have some like some list of possible errors that could have contributed to like how this data has turned out, um, are the are there, do you feel like there's like, like a lot of tests you can do um, to test your hypotheses about like what errors are showing up in this data? Or do you feel like most of those tests actually require new experiments that you need to sort of like go out and do in a real population? Um, so I think like the natural extension would for, for TED would be to somehow start by uh, trying to quantify some of these errors. So that's something that's also done in the TSC. So they tell you how you can quantify uh, coverage error, how you can quantify sampling error. And that's not something that we've um, done yet we would really like to do. I think this first step was to document, like at least give a name to the different errors and then maybe the next step would be to try to come up with ways which would maybe uh, build on some statistical tests that already exist uh, to see how we can quantify some of these errors. So stay tuned. Yeah, but one thing you could also do is like, I mean, re annotate part of your data, uh, see if you can find the model that they run for annotation. What's usually done is the training example, you run it to annotate the rest. I mean, that's also what we're, for, for example, we're actually using this to, to dig into some of these errors, so like uh, especially signals, uh, signal augmentation error we're doing right now, where we look at sexism, and there's uh, things that are, that, that are annotated already, and you re-annotate, and you run different methods, and you see what happens when you give it, or when you withhold certain features of, of the tweet, for example, and you see what happens actually when you do that. Um, so you can do, certainly can do uh, some quantification that, like, what is the change in your precision when you, or, uh, when, when you do that? Like, you, for example, yeah, you look at this and then you say, okay, well, how did they collect the data? And in the collection already, if you only use certain hashtags, uh, do you might hide the hashtags when you train, that's fine, but still these tweets are very different from other tweets that are sexist, for example, yeah, that do not use the hashtags, even if you hide the hashtags from the model. So, and then you can, if you know that this was the collection method, then you can try and try to hide other features or you can collect more tweets without that word. Like you do this query expansion and say, okay, obviously these words also, these keywords also uh, have something to do with that construct. I collect some more, re-annotate them, for example, and then see how the model does then. That the model, if, if maybe, if ideally they have also the, mod, the, the, the training model is available, for example. So these are all things like the whole, Thinking about how this was done and what was the intention in doing it. Um, yeah. Thank you. And I guess one other comment before I like, uh, one thing you also have to keep in mind: what happens a lot, I think personally, is that errors cancel each other out. That is also something that is again, I guess it's like overfitting. It's basically you, you have an error and you have another error, and then basically they or, or you have these the super unreliable method, but in the end it's not a bias, so it, it cancels out somehow, and then you have a completely different data set differently created, and you wonder why it doesn't work anymore. And, and then if you really would think about what happens here, like, for example, if I augment the, all the entities and I do errors across the board, um, and then I do re-weighting afterwards, and it kind of seems to work, and I'm arriving at the, what the survey said, and then I'm like, oh, that works well, and then I wonder when the next time I do it for a different construct, for example, it doesn't work anymore. And that could simply be because then you have an actual bias in there, yeah? So that is also something that I think is often hidden if you only talk about typical F, like macro F1 or something like this, then in the end we hide a lot of errors in the pipeline and then we wonder why it doesn't work. And then we just try another model and, and turn some wheels somewhere and then the F1 goes up and they're like, oh, we're better. 
but why are we better? That's the question. That, I think that helps a lot to try to understand why you're actually better or worse. I'm not sure about like the privacy concerns, but one way I think that like um, one thing I think that survey researchers could definitely um, perhaps benefit from is uh, looking at some of these uh, large scale techniques for um, annotating syntactic uh, information or that's just one example, but doing things at larger scale. So I think that there are lots of methods coming up uh, in computer vision, in NLP, you see so much, uh, so many ways, uh, so many different sentiment analysis techniques that are super powerful, but um, perhaps um, they still haven't received that much attention when it comes to survey research, where some of that is still um, using sentiment lexicon. So I think uh, that is one way that it could be helpful uh, to learn from the other community. With regards to privacy, c can you maybe uh, repeat that question? Um, I guess I was just uh, curious about if there are um, certain like guidelines, I guess, for, for for doing this kind of research. Like for example, I guess I was thinking of like you know like census, like survey collecting d data. Like um, if you were tr to try to augment that that data collection process using digital trace, like then there would be some privacy concerns that would arise from that. And so just like as in terms of like a research community, like think about like policies around like using mm. digital trace to kind of augment that. Um, and so I think one, uh, so this is also explored, I think in quite a bit of depth uh, in Matt Selganik's book, Bit by Bit. So mm -hmm. uh, which tells you that in this uh, digital age, how we can sort of expand some of the um, privacy uh, constraints that we have. So one example that he suggests, I think, uh, is this idea of informed consent. Uh, so perhaps when you're combining web tracking data, but then you also have uh, surveys, so there you could ask people, there you could really uh, delineate what their data will be used for. So for example, we use Twitter data so much, uh, right? It's become like very uh, central for the research community. But many of these users, when they sign up for Twitter, they did not sign up to, be, uh, to give that data to researchers. And there are some studies that show that some of them are quite anxious about uh, user about researchers using their data for such kind of uh, inferences. So I think one way to complement that would be to have more informed consent, where uh, you ask people that are you okay with your digital traces uh, being combined with your survey responses. Um, so yeah. So what, what we're doing already at the cases we're doing this. So that web tracking is the one thing. So there are m many commercial services that do this, like marketing uh, research. What we do right now is buy that. Like, that is also something we I think we should change uh, generally. Like um, we should more like the actual the research institutes, maybe the survey ones. Like there's also in the United States and all over Europe are these institutes actually collect these more in this form, like either data donations or running panels and actually asking people. So b before you start, we're gonna collect this and we're gonna collect this, right? And uh, then basically they say we are okay with this. Then of course this is self-selected somehow, but it's controlled a little bit. I think that would be a good solution to doing this instead of like ex post trying to create links between unknowing people uh, offline to their online profiles. I think that's something a way that is e neither feasible nor is it ethically uh, okay. I would say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you.